This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. So last week I was talking about alienation in the labour process and uh, the extension of that alienation given uh, contemporary transformations in divisions of labour, uh, the rise of meaningless jobs, uh, and the increasing uh, problems uh, of uh, alienation, not only of, of labor, but also of capital. Now, one of the arguments which uh, is being made by people like Andre Gortz is that during the 1960s and 1970s, uh, many people in the working classes uh, were very well aware of their situation and felt the alienation and were actively involved in trying to do something about it, to restructure uh, the uh, labor processes in ways which uh, were less alienating, uh, to set up uh, uh, trade councils and things of that kind that were going to do something in a very different sort of way. Uh, I think that one of the uh, arguments that came out during that period was there was a struggle over this, but uh, Andre Gortz and others argued that this was a losing struggle and that there was something else going on uh, which was equally important. And what was equally important was uh, uh, the response to the uprisings of uh, 1968, uh, which were very much about individual, individual liberty and freedom. Uh, and uh, social justice. And the response of the capitalist class uh, to this was to try to satisfy wants, needs and desires uh, by moving towards a much more consumer sort of society. And out of this there came a theory of what we might call compensatory consumerism. It basically was a kind of a Faustian bargain between capital and labor in which capital basically said to labor, all right, we know we cannot be uh, creating labor processes which are uh, adequate to you, but we can compensate you for that so that when you come out of the labor process and go home, you've got a wonderful cornucopia of consumer products that you can have and that therefore the, the happiness you will experience from all of these consumer products uh, will uh, compensate for the fact that you have a miserable time at work. And uh, out of this uh, there came the idea of a, a reasonably affluent working class, an affluent working class which uh, was uh, uh, going to take its, uh, you know, uh, its recreational vehicle and, and take vacations and do all of those sorts of things. So the idea of compensatory consumerism became very, very significant. And what we've seen, of course, is a, a huge burst since the 1970s, 1980s into new forms of consumerism. And the most important thing about them was that were, these were not mass consumption in the ordinary kind of sense. A lot of it was niche specific. That is, you created consumer niches and you invited people to occupy those niches. And this was very much attached to the sort of fragmentation also uh, uh, through identity politics of different lifestyles and the like, uh, including, of course, uh, different modes of expression of sexuality and, 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 and so on. So that con compensatory consumerism uh, was seen as one of the answers to the alienations which were being experienced in, in, in the workplace. But the problem with the compensatory consumerism was, first off, it required that uh, the consumers had enough effective demand, had enough money, had enough in terms of wages, uh, that uh, they could actually go into the stores and buy all of the stuff. Now, one of the answers here, again, from capital was, we may not increase your wages, but we lower the cost of all of these consumer goods. So one of the things that happened during the 1970s and 1980s, that while wages remained stagnant, what those wages could buy was increasing at a constant rate because of the Walmart economy and the, you know, the general uh, decline in, in, in costs of uh, consumer goods. 
so that the material well-being of much of the working classes at the time could, could improve uh, to some degree uh, in relationship uh, to a fairly stagnant uh, situation with respect to wage levels. But here too there comes a point where uh, it's not clear that compensatory consumerism really works very well and in this I think uh, we have to actually start to look at the consumer side of what capital is about, how capital seeks to transform wants, needs and desires uh, in such a way as to create the kind of uh, market that is required for rational consumption from the standpoint of capital so that the increasing productivity of labor uh, is actually then uh, turned back to the workers through the, the, the declining uh, cost of uh, consumer products. But compensatory consumerism uh, it hasn't worked very well for a couple of reasons. The first is that to the degree that as the 1980s wore on, so if you like, the, the, the affluent working class came under attack through automation and through uh, the re revival of uh, or, or revitalization uh, of uh, manufacturing along high tech kind of uh, lines. And the, kind of, the affluent worker, as it was often referred to in the early 1980s, was gradually under assault. Union power uh, was being uh, diminished by a variety of means of both political attack, but also uh, the substitution of uh, that working class uh, in the factories by, by automation so that fewer and fewer workers uh, could uh, actually work in, in that. So the declining purchasing power of large segments of the population uh, left large segments of that population very much on the margins of this compensatory consumerism. And those that were in, in, in incorporated if, in, in, in the sort of uh, compensatory consumerism began to uh, have certain frustrations with the nature of the products that they were uh, actually being, being offered. Uh, there is a kind of a, uh, an interesting history here which uh, on, on the sales side. Uh, I always remember reading uh, Zola's novel about uh, the, the, uh, uh, the department store in Paris, the new department store. And uh, the um, prefect of the Paris is talking to the main shop owner and says, how do you manage to make such a profit? And the answer came back, well, get the women. Get the women as consumers and then the men will have to pay. And that was the gendered way in which it was set up. Uh, and, I, and I've always think about that every time I go into a department store because the lower form of the, the first thing you encounter on almost all department stores is perfumes and, and handbags and all of women's products. And you have to go up on the fourth floor in the corner to find the men's room, men's, uh, the men's uh, stuff. So get the women was important, but actually since 1945 there's been another line and it became very strong after the 1970s and 1980s and that's get the kids, get the children, get the children as consumers and the kind of a, a real assault upon consumerism so that the, 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 you, you, know, you see kids in the stores kind of saying, oh, well, can I have this, can I have that, can I have this, can I have that, and, and get the kids became very much an important part of of this. But this is, this is not very satisfactory. To begin with, a, a lot of the products which were entering into the consumerism, the con compensatory consumerism, were rather shoddy products. And a lot of them fell apart. And, and of course, one of the things that capital does not want is to have products which last a long time. Because if they last a long time, then there's no new market. So the compensatory consumerism, given the dynamics of the market, uh, was about actually trying to create uh, new fashions on a daily basis, trying to create also products which did not last, uh, so that you had to plan obsolescence all of the time. So you find a, find a, a, a tremendous kind of dynamism in consumer markets, which uh, at a certain point people find frustrating. Furthermore, it turns out that many of the uh, goods which come into the consumer, compensatory consumerism, which are sold to you as saving time and, and, and labor and all the rest of it, turn out not to do that at all. 
And there's a very interesting kind of moment in Capital when Marx talks about John Stuart Mill. And John Stuart Mill kind of uh, uh, was wondering out loud uh, why it was that the new technologies which were coming into the factories was not, were not actually lo lightening the load of labor, but they seemed to maybe be making the burden of labor uh, much heavier. And Marx's answer to that is, well, of course that's the case, because the, 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 the purpose of the new technologies is not to lighten the load of labor, uh, it's actually to increase the rate of exploitation of the labor force. Uh, and I feel the same way about many of the, of the new technologies which uh, have come into household. Household technologies, consumer durables, became the basis of a lot of this compensatory consumerism. So everybody had to have a refrigerator, everybody had to have a washing machine, uh, everybody had to have a dishwasher, washer, uh, everybody had to have a TV, everybody had to have uh, uh, computers, everybody had to have computer games and, and all the rest of it. So actually you see that there's a tremendous amount uh, of uh, expansion of that consumer demand which is absorbing uh, the, the, the sort of much of the surplus productive capacity which exists in a capitalist economy. So that the role of these con household uh, goods and consumer durables is really to create a new market and to create an ever-expanding market. And a market which is uh, very uh, short term, does not, often does not last, so that uh, we need a new computer uh, every uh, three or four years, we need a, uh, a new iPhone uh, you know, once every two years, those kinds of things. So we have a very rapid turnover in, in consumption, uh, even to the point where capital starts to cultivate forms of consumption which are pretty much instantaneous and are non-exclusionary. By this I mean that a lot of capital gets invested in making, say, uh, a Netflix uh, yeah, s series. Um, and, uh, but that Netflix series can be consumed instantaneously uh, by a vast population, and it's not exclusionary in the sense that if I watch it, it doesn't stop somebody else watching it. So the forms of consumption start to change. So instead of making things that last a long time and which uh, satisfy a particular need uh, like uh, uh, knives and forks and plates and things like that, you create uh, uh, a vast industry of uh, making spectacle. And, and it's fascinating to me to, to actually uh, suddenly look at the range of uh, new films which get released and there's a huge number of them, uh, most of which I'd never heard of, but they absor that absorbs a vast amount of, uh, of capital in terms of its uh, production uh, and it then feeds a consumer market which is, like I say, instantaneous uh, or very short term in the sense that, you know, you watch a, uh, a Netflix episode in an hour and that's it. It's done, that's your consumption, and then you turn to the next hour and the, then you get people binge watching and all the rest of it. So, 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 so the whole consumer world is, 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 is changing and transforming. But that's not changing and transforming in a way which necessarily is more satisfying and more satisfactory. So, so that compensatory consumerism uh, can also uh, work in other areas uh, and, uh, and with all sorts of uh, problematic uh, consequences. Uh, for example, uh, the growth of tourism. Tourism is of course a, a huge industry now uh, and it's a vast amount of uh, expenditures going on on that and again, con you know, con tourism means that people will go and visit a place and in effect consume the vision of that place in one day and then turn around and go to the next place and consume the vision of that. So it's a particularly interesting form of consumption. But increasingly tourism is having all kinds of negative effects. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the ways in which you would say that the problem right now is that forms of consumerism of this sort are neither particularly satisfying, because you go to some place and you're, you're, you, know, you, you, want, you want to go to some place where it's peaceful and quiet and what you find is millions of people milling around. There are all these consumer sites now that are rated in terms of uh, how impossible it is to do anything there for any length of time. 
Um, I recently visited Florence and I couldn't wait to get out of the place because it was just absolutely killed by excessive tourism. I think Venice is the same, I've never, though I've never actually uh, been there. And there are some cities now that are trying to control tourism. Uh, Barcelona, for example, uh, is, uh, suffers from an excess of uh, tourist industry, and so they're trying to cut back on uh, Airbnb and uh, hotel construction and all the rest of it, because uh, once all of those hotels are there, the character of the place starts to, to disintegrate and it becomes less and less uh, satisfying. And, and who wants to go to a place which uh, is beautiful to look at to find oneself, uh, you know, with mobs of people uh, milling around, uh, you, you know, usually uh, eating uh, hot dogs and and, and hamburgers and, and and drinking Coca-Cola and littering the place. So there there are these modes of consumerism which have uh, which which at one time uh, seemed to offer some compensatory consumerism to the point where modes of, of consumerism which no longer are satisfying. And so here we have a situation in which the form of consumerism uh, is not compensating, the form of the labor process is not doing too well. And out of that we find ourselves in a situation in which there are discontented populations Discontented populations because the two basic elements of their lives, which is the daily life they're leading in, in, in the residence and the daily work rhythm that they're engaged upon, neither of them are representing anything that is very satisfactory for many people. And the dissatisfaction kind of says, well, there's something really clearly wrong uh, with the way in which our society is headed. If you ask the question, is our society headed in a good direction or a bad direction? Most people, I think, would say it doesn't seem to be like it's heading to a good direction at all. And then you kind of say, well, what are the institutions uh, which are supposed to protect us? Uh, in the sense that uh, the length of the working day got regulated in some way, is there some way in which regulatory apparatuses can be created uh, which will control uh, the un, un, unregulated uh, forms of, uh, of both uh, production and, uh, uh, and, and con consumption, which are now dominating in our society. And here, uh, too, I think there is a sense that the political side of things has gone from bad to worse that the political side of things has not actually addressed many of these foundational questions, which is why I think the question of alienation becomes very, very significant. Because if you have alienated populations, then uh, alienated populations are likely to look around and say, well, what are the kinds of institutions and what are the kinds of means by which uh, somehow or other I can find some satisfaction in, in, this, in this world? And I think one of the things that has been increasingly evident since the 1980s has been the rise of religion, and particularly evangelical uh, Christianity and uh, more radical forms of uh, uh, Islam and, and, and the like, uh, as in a sense uh, a compensatory uh, um, process for the lack of meaning in the sort of daily life and daily work rhythms that uh, surround us. Uh, beyond that, of course, there is uh, a vast well of discontent with the political process. The political process is more and more uh, working in terms of the ruling ideas of a ruling class, and the ruling ideas of a ruling class are essentially saying uh, you should actually recognize that it's important that capital work efficiently, and the efficiency of capital is everything. Uh, it's, it's responsibility for the environment and it's responsibility for everything else is, 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 is irrelevant uh, compared to uh, this, this quest for more and more e efficiency. Now this creates a situation in which there's alienation uh, from labor processes, widespread alienation uh, in relationship to contemporary consumerism, alienation in relationship to the political process, alienation with, uh, in relation to many of those institutions which traditionally have uh, helped us cope with things and given meaning to, to life in a certain kind of way. And out of that comes 
pop comes a situation where alienated populations are in a sense sitting there discontented uh, engaging in what I would call passive aggressive withdrawal that is kind of a uh, an inability to care for anything because if you try to care for anything it soon becomes meaningless because it gets taken over so that what was once a beautiful kind of uh, a vacation suddenly becomes a very marred vacation because of the situation of mass uh, mass tourism and the like so you find you find this world is is around us is infused with alienations of all sorts and of all methods and what happens with alienated populations is that they 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 have a hidden anger a, a big deep well of anger that somebody somewhere is 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 gaining at my expense and alienated populations can then be mobilized and this is where i think uh, there is the kind of question of who is to blame for the current situation of alienations and one of the things that capital ensures given that it has control over the ruling ideas ensures is that capital will be the last to be blamed that uh, the whole capital accumulation process will be the last to be blamed uh, and that therefore there is a, a, a quest to find others to blame and the others are uh, immigrants, uh, lazy people, people not like me, people who offend the moral code, uh, people who do not share my religious views or something of that kind. So um, what this leads to is a certain political instability. And we're seeing now the, that political instability emerging all around the world in the form of uh, these strange authoritarian figures who suddenly capture uh, the anger of people and say give me your anger and I will channel it in ways and I will tell you who the who the problem is the problem of the immigrants the problem is this the problem is that we can redirect you it's minorities it's people of color it's women it's whatever and and uh, then we got what we get is the kind of politics that there are today now I know this is a very crude kind of representation of the situation but I think there's a certain virtue in in, in in the crudity uh, because it says basically that capital has reached a, a positionality in terms of the dynamic of accumulation the dynamic of, uh, of continuous expansion the dynamic of uh, uh, debt peonage and the dynamic of, of uh, wage slavery and the dynamic of uh, people slaving away to try to make sense of their daily lives in terms of compensatory consumerism and household technologies which absorb a lot of time and, and don't free it up so the frustrations are manifold and and i think that we need to bring back the concept of alienation into the dialogue because we will not understand what is happening to politics uh, without actually saying well if you have an alienated population an alienated population that is uh, engaging in in, uh, in 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 the blame game, or is can be can be, uh, if you like, encouraged to engage in the blame game. So we will find there are whole populations which have essentially uh, given up. And when we start to look at uh, some of the things that have been happening in, uh, say, rural Ohio or in uh, the smaller towns of uh, East Germany or uh, the smaller towns in, in Europe, we find uh, essentially uh, whole life uh, con configurations being abandoned uh, and people disappearing into uh, you know, drug and alcoholic addictions and opioid crises and so on. And the first time for a long time, actually life expectancy uh, in many of these places has been declining. It's been declining in Britain, it's been de declining in many parts of the United States. And what this suggests is that there's a general malaise uh, in populations, that they feel abandoned, they feel uh, neglected, they feel impossible, that there's nothing possible to do, uh, except uh, when uh, somebody comes along and says, follow me and I will create the protest which will uh, release uh, your anger and channel your anger, uh, then we're seeing the, emergent, the emergence of these very right-wing uh, uh, sort of populist uh, movements all around the world. Just look at the situation. Uh, I've just come back from uh, 
Brazil, the situation in Brazil is disastrous. With Bol not only Bolsonaro, but it's uh, the whole kind of society has moved very much to the right uh, and is using these, these uh, circumstances uh, uh, to sort of uh, try to establish uh, the power, re-establish the power of capital on the basis of a, on authoritarian, neo-fascist kind of politics. We see the same thing going on in Hungary, the same thing going on in Poland. We see attempts for this to go on in Germany and in France. Uh, we see Modi in uh, India. Uh, we see uh, Erdogan in, in, uh, in Turkey, Sisi in, in Egypt. I mean, just go around the world and what you're seeing is the emergence. And of course, Duterte is one of the most disastrous forms of this in the Philippines. We're seeing disastrous political forms emerging. And I think we need, uh, therefore, right now to be able to connect the emergence of these new political forms, which are uh, obnoxious and, uh, uh, and disastrous, but we need to understand their rootedness in the economic situation. That is, we need to uh, actually create a political economy which puts together an understanding of alienation which is being always latent within a capitalist society, the inability to cure that alienation and the spread of that alienation uh, with the political consequences which we are, which we are seeing uh, to this day. Uh, this to me is uh, the potentiality for a very tragic uh, uh, situation and I think the left needs uh, to, to confront this full on, uh, not just simply kind of uh, complain about fascism but understand the rootedness of it and where it's coming from and what we should do about it in terms of addressing uh, the foundational forms of alienation that Marx unraveled, particularly in the Grundrisse and actually unraveled in capital without calling it alienation. And I think this is something which uh, uh, those of us who are concerned with trying to create modes of thinking and modes of analysis uh, to address the contemporary situation, that this is one of the things that we should all be thinking about and working upon. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.